today we'll talk about the formation and continuing from the last class we'll continue talking about the formation of kerosene and kerosene is what kerosene is a um, transitional material from organic matter to the petroleum right so when you have an organic matter in sediments it will be transformed to the kerosene and when the temperature and pressure is right then this kerosene will give off the petroleum, the oil and gas. So uh, we talked about the diagenesis, right? That's the from organic metal to kerosene, and the kerosene to petroleum is called the catagenesis. Right? And when you have a petroleum or the hydrocarbon, and hydrocarbon, there's a hydrogen, right? The ratio between H to C became decreased during this metagenesis. So in the end of the metagenesis, it becomes a graphite, just a pure carbon. Right? So the, the metagenesis is the term that is show, uh, telling the uh, removal of the hydrogen and also the breakdown of the uh, long hydrocarbon chain. Right? So I think we'll talk about the catagenesis today in this section. Right? Uh, so during this phase of catagenesis, kerogen matures and it gives off the oil and gas. And there is a, so when it's not a pure or the early stage of the kerogen, it doesn't produce the oil and gas. But uh, when the temperature is proper, it will give you the oil and they will give you the gas. So in the temperature range, 60 to 100 degrees Celsius, to uh, produce the oil. It's been known for that. And uh, when the temperature is higher than that, then it will produce the gas. So the rate of the maturation may be dependent on temperature and time and pressure. So uh, if you think about the sedimentation rate, the some certain formation or the source rock will get steeper as time goes by because there will be more and more sedimentation coming up. So the temperature is going to increase and when the temperature is in this region, then you will pro produce the oil and you will produce the gas in order. And when the temperature is more than this, uh, your 225 degrees Celsius, then it's called the uh, overmature, so there is no petroleum produced, uh, hydrocarbon produced from the kerosene. Uh, so when you look at this graph, it shows that uh, from here is the early stage of the uh, kerosene, type 1 and type 2 and type 3, so early stage. And as you go this direction, time increases and also temperature increases. So this is the window for the oil generation, and this is the uh, window for the, the gas generation, and, and then it becomes the pure carbon graphite. The so same, so here the, depending on the depth, you have a window for oil and you have a window for the, the gas, the system gas. And the rate of the chemical reaction is related, so how fast and uh, how well the kerogen give off or the provide the uh, oil and gas is function of temperature and the time. So as the temperature increases, the reaction rate increases. So this is pretty much the same. It's telling you the same mature oil generation and the gas generation window depending on the temperature. And I think this gives you the more general view. Um, so let's look at here, the x-axis is the time. So here this is the uh, now the present time. And present time, you have uh, this kind of a lithology, the geology formation from the subsurface, uh, from the surface to the uh, uh, some deeper region, so seven kilometer deep. And geologists found that this is the formation of source rock. Right? And then the question is when the source rock enter the oil and gas window, 
So now it tells you this source lag is in between the temperature is above 100 degrees Celsius right? and below the 220 degrees Celsius. So this is the uh, proper window for the gas generation. But in the past, because it, if we go back, it will be shallower than as it is now. So there should be a time window that has the formation temperature was proper for, proper to, proper for the oil generation. So the question is when source rock enters the oil window and the gas window. If we go back, this formation is Jurassic formation. Right? So Jurassic formation. So all this stage, but in the Jurassic time, this formation was sedimented and it becomes deeper and deeper. And it, at, that, at this time, the, there was much more uh, organic activity. And so your organic matter is preserved in this formation and it becomes the source rock in the present day that is found, find right now. But the, the geologists also interested in their, uh, when the source rock produced the oil, or was it the oil prone source rock or the gas prone source rock? So it may be just either of them or it could be both of them. So there was a, uh, this Boreal, and it's, this is called the Boreal, his, Boreal History Curve. Okay. So the petroleum generation from kerosene is related to the temperature and the maturity of the kerosene. So there are a bunch of questions related to this kind of uh, uh, information. So are there organic rich source rock in the basin? Are they present in large volume? And uh, are, these, are these kerosene oil prone or gas prone, and whether or not the source rock have mature sufficiently to generate petroleum or they are super matured. And bottom of temperature does not indicate. So we looked at the, uh, the temperature window, but the bottom of temperature only tells you the, uh, the current temperature. So it does not tell you the, uh, the past historical temperature record. So the, we have have to find the temperature of this formation in the past. It's called a paleo thermometer. And this can measure the maximum temperature to which the source rock was ever subjected. So basically, we are looking at some formation. Let's say that this is Jurassic formation. And we are tracing the temperature of this formation as we go back to the past. It's called a paleo thermometer. And there are a bunch of techniques to measure this maximum temperature of formation in the history. So chemical method and the biological method. Right? And chemical method is the organic method and the inorganic method. There are carbon ratio, electrospin resonance, pyrolysis, gas chromatography, et cetera, et cetera. But, uh, let's look at some example here. Uh, carbon ratio method. So as organic matter matures, as time goes by, the organic carbon is lost because they decay. So we take the sample and we just uh, burn up the sample to remove all the organic matter and then measure the mass. So then we can compare the how much carbon was there and the organic carbon was there, right? And that's the uh, total, uh, the residual carbon and the source rock Depending on the source rock time, there should be a reference that this source rock has the total carbon. Right? So some, this source rock has this amount of carbon. And you compare that, then the ratio CR to CT increases with the maturation. But the, the, there are, because also there are some problems because it's not easy to calibration. And there are many assumptions to use this carbon ratio method. And the second, Representative method is the gas chromatography. So you take the sample and extract the pore fluid, and then you run the gas chromatography. And study the distribution of N arcane, so it's a paraffinic oil, and N arcane evolve with increasing temperature and barrier depth. So that as matured, you have more sharp peak, and in mature stage, you have like broad peak. So from that, we can identify and then uh, evaluate the maturity of this kerogen in the source rock. So these are just uh, two examples, and there are more uh, methods 
to measure the maximum temperature and the uh, maturity of the kerosene. Uh, so result will be like this. This is similar to the logging result, right? So here, organic carbon contents, and you can see there's a high peak, high organic contents in this region. So around 300, no, 3,400 liter, right? 34 and uh, 36 liter, we can estimate that this will be the source rock because it's a very rich in organic matter. And it's from the uh, pyrolysis analysis also it shows that the high organic content and hydrogen content is also high. And uh, we can also identify the kerogen type. So this is what? Angophos kerogen, argar kerogen, Anything here, either kerogen and wood kerogen. Right? The type of the kerogen can be also noted here. And spore, so, so there's no spore. And so some other biological indication. So from these, these kind of analysis tool, we can identify the source rock. And they can be correlated to the reservoir. So the where was the source rock, and the right now, the current reservoir is here. So, <clears throat> so depending as as we go deeper, so as depth increases, the window for oil generation and gas generation is different. So here, the, you have a oil window. The temperature range from here to here is a proper for oil generation from kerosene. And deeper region, you have a gas window. OK. So, so far, we've seen the uh, diagenesis from organic matter to kerosene and the catagenesis gets kerosene to the, the petroleum hydrocarbon, and then you have a source rock that contains the hydrocarbon. And mostly the source rock is shale. So, but you found the reservoir in sandstone or carbonate, which have high porosity. So source rock is different from reservoir. So there should be some movement of the petroleum from source rock to this Reservoir, so the hydrocarbon was migrated to some some region, and it's trapped, and it gets accumulated. And that's the commercial reservoir that we find these days. So oil and gas don't really originate in the rock in which they are found. They must have migrated into it from elsewhere. So these are the facts. Okay. So uh, organic matter is easily destroyed by oxidation in post permeable sediments at the earth surface. Therefore, it must have invaded the reservoir rock after considerable barrier and raised the temperature. So if it gets buried in the uh, high post sediment in the subsurface, then it will be very easily oxidized and it will decay very fast. Okay? It's not good for preserve the organic matter. Um, so the shale, that's why the source rock is mostly the shale. And oil and gas open occur in solution pores and fractures that must have formed after the barrier and justification of the host rock, host rock. And oil and gas are trapped in the highest point, which implies the upward and lateral migration. So this means that if you have some formation, oil and gas is, let me see, this is the cap rock. And oil and gas is mostly accumulated at the highest point, in the sandstone formation. So that means that it's buoyancy, by the buoyancy force, it has been migrated and then trapped. So if it's just a source rock, then organ matter should be, or the hydrocarbon should be just dispersed, eh? distributed homogeneously. But it, it's not. Eh? So that's why we, uh, we are sure that there was a migration from source rock to the reservoir. And what else? So they are, they are free to migrate particularly and naturally within the reservoir. Mm -hmm. So that 
uh, people think that there are two stages of migration. First is the primary migration, and the sec second is secondary migration. Primary migration is from the source rock to the carrier bed. So if we think about this, let's go back to the So this is the sandstone formation, and cap rock, maybe shale, and there are maybe shale here, right? So this is the source rock. This is very like, simplified geologic structure. Just imagine that there are hydrocarbons produced in here, and this has been moved to the sand, sandstone and it migrates to the column accumulation here. Right? So then primary migration is the movement from shale to this sandstone carrier. Right? And the secondary migration is within this sandstone formation. Right? So for, uh, we call it carrier bed. Right? So from here to here is the secondary. And from here to here is the primary, primary migration. And secondary migration is pretty straightforward. It will be just moved by the buoyancy force because the oil is lighter than the water, right? And it will just flow through the high permeable region. So uh, it will be just depending on the, or affected by the structure, geology formation structure and the geometry, but the primary migration is still in debate. It's in the question. So nobody, the geologists are still working on it, and uh, there are many hypotheses, but it has not been uh, narrowed down to one or two. Uh, so this is the, what they call it, still a matter of debate and the uh, mystery of the petroleum geology. And source rock is clay and shale, and how and what happened to these hydrocarbons and they moved from source rock to the permeable carrier bed that is the, uh, the biggest mystery in the uh, petroleum geology. So we'll just go through and uh, we'll think about how this hydrocarbon in the source rock can be migrated to the carrier bed from now on, just briefly. Uh, so basic questions could be when the migration occur and what will be the physical environment during this migration and uh, what was the chemical composition of the hydrocarbon or the source at, at the moment and the nature of the hydrocarbon at the, at, during the primary migration and so there are so many questions that we haven't answered yet. Um, the major paradox for primary migration is oil and gas are trapped in coarse permeable reservoir, the carbonate or the sandstone, and source rock is impermeable shale. And then how did the fluid migrate? Were well, oil and gas squeezed from the source clay during early burial before compaction destroyed permeability? So people think that because they are this clay will become the clay stone and become the shale as it gets deeper because of the pressure, right? And during this compaction, the porosity will decrease, right? So this compaction will give off the, pre the fluid because the water should escape from the, shale, the clay so that they may have rendered the primary migration. They thought that, but the uh, this is not possible because the temperature uh, are high enough to generate the hydrocarbon, it would be already so deep so that there would be no, not much difference in the porosity. So this is the, uh, one of the uh, evidence showing that, uh, arguing, arguing this compaction theory because uh, you think that you're so, uh, you can see here the temperature is the oil window, oil generation window is from here to here, right? And in this region, as you get compacted, the porosity changes very small, right? From here to 
here. It's still in a, around like 20%. So there are not much very large squeeze of the shell. So this is not unlikely. And the other theory is the water expulsion during clay compaction. So there are two types of water in clay. One is the just normal pulp water, free water, and the structural water. And I think uh, you learned about the um, clay mineralogy in soil mechanics class. Eh? The clay has negative charge, right? and so it has the double layer. And further from clay surface, well, from the clay surfaces, clay has negative charge, so that it absorbs the water. You have a water water layer, and after that, as you go further, then you have a free water. Right? Free water will escape very easily during the compaction, right? and but still you have a structured water. And this theory, this hypothesis, uh, claims that this structured water can escape during this chemical reaction because the momolonite, that is mainly targeting the momolonite. And momolonite has large and very thick double layer, and they have large amount of structured water. And when the momolonite changes to elite at proper temperature, it pro uh, produces the water, free water. And this free water can escape during this further compaction. So this diagram shows that this is momolonite clay. And when the temperature is in this optimum range, this changes to elite, and during this reaction, uh, you have a free pore water. And this pore water can contain the hydrocarbon, and this pore water can escape to the permeable carrier bed, that's the one theory. And also the baker, the other scientist, pursue this idea showing that it's not only water, but also the hydrocarbon can be attached to the, to the clay lattices and they can be migrate to the uh, permeable carrier bed. But there are also opposing arguments here. You can read it. Um, the second theory is that petroleum migration through the microfracture. So even in clay, there are some microfractures during the uh, this Mystification when they become the rock. So the microfractures cause a market increase in permeability and it allows to allow fluid to escape so that it will close as pore pressure drop and petroleum global could migrate by shouldering aside this unfixed clay chain grain. So it basically it just use the microfractures as a fluid conduit to escape. And Whatever the, uh, this, the origin is, what was the, uh, whatever the, uh, they escape, the late expulsion must play an important role in primary migration of petroleum. And various theories for primary migration can be grouped as follows. So here are several hypotheses explaining the uh, petroleum migration. And petroleum can be migrated as a form of oil, or as it is, like an immiscible fluid. That's called the free oil here. And probably they can be transported in AQ space as a dissolved form. Here, this is the one theory. And if there's a surfactant, the hydrocarbon can be soluble in the water. And it's called the micelle, micelle theory here. Yeah. And if there's a CO2 or other gassy hydrocarbon, uh, hydrocarbon can be also mixed with the, this CO2 or the liquid hydrocarbon, or the gaseous hydrocarbon. So high molecular hydrocarbon can be dissolved in this gaseous CO2 or A light hydrocarbon. And the last one is the proto-petroleum. This is the uh, uh, 
intermediate stage between carrier to petroleum chloride hour. So let's look at the first one. And whether the transformation from carrier to crude oil is completed before, during, or after migration from source rock is difficult to identify. So the, the point is that we don't know whether this primary migration is being conducted during this catagenesis or before catagenesis or after catagenesis. So this, this hypothesis is that crude oil and gas have very low solubility in water, so migration occurs before the hydrocarbons are recognizable crude oil while they are in the form of the ketone, acid, yeast, ether, which are soluble in water. And this transitional phase is from the protopetroleum. But the, there are uh, opposing, opposing arguments against this hypothesis. The most probable theory is the hot oil theory and the mycer theory. The hot oil theory is that uh, hydrocarbon is dissolved in the water, and then when they get expelled by squeeze during the compaction or the clay reaction, then this hydrocarbon has been moved to the permeable carrier bed. So the solubility of hydrocarbon is negligible in atmospheric pressure, like in ambient, ambient conditions, but it will be much higher in the high temperature and the high pressure condition, and also in the condition with the uh, micelle. My cell is basically the same as the surfactant. The solubility becomes significant above 150 degrees Celsius, and the temperature for optimum oil generation is 100 degrees Celsius. So here in this region, in, in the range of this temperature, uh, you have quite a lot of quite high and significant solubility in water. So that the water, the water contains the hydrocarbon and there has been uh, audibectively transported to the, uh, the sandstone, the permeable carrier band. And so hydrocarbon basically solubility increases with decreasing carbon number. And also, uh, so carbon number decreases, then the solubility also increases. So Heavy and long chain will have low solubility, but the, the light carbon, hydrocarbon will have the higher solubility. So it claims that the gaseous hydrocarbons are easy to migrate in a dissolved form, and etc. etc. Et but the opposing argument is that only 55% of the typical crude oil is composed of the moderately uh, soluble alkane, and the another quarter, 25%, is composed of the heavy, naphthene, and the aromatics, which is not soluble in water. So hot oil theory does not completely explain the primary migration. It may explain partly, but uh, it's not a complete theory. And the second theory is the micelle theory. Micelle is colloidal organic acid salt whose molecules have hydrophobic branch and the hydrophilic branch. So basically it's the same as the surfactant. Right? You have a hydrophobic branch and the hydrophilic branch, so it increases the solubility. Right? So presence of the micelle enhances solubility of the hydrocarbon, even uh, aromatic hydrocarbon and then naphthenic hydrocarbon. The, so they claim that with the high temperature and with the micelles, they have been dissolved in the water and then transported. It. But the problem is the size of the micelle molecule is greater than the diameter of the pore throat in clay source. So the shale has four size of nanometer, like 50, no, 5 nanometer, maybe uh, 20 nanometer. So 50 angstrom to 200 angstrom is the pore size of the uh, shale. But the micelle has 
And this is more than 10 nanometers. The size itself, the molecule is too big to right, penetrate and uh, pass through this whole size of the shell. So that was the one argument opposing this theory. Um, okay. So the other theory is that the expulsion of the oil in gaseous solution and the expulsion of oil as free this oil droplet or continuous phase of oil. I think you can read this through, but uh, these two are not very convincing theories. So I think the uh, most widely accepted theory is the micell and the hot oil theory. So maybe you can just read this through when you have time. And so once the petroleum migration has been integrated with this sedimentary basin, you have a system, petroleum system. So before, it's a sedimentary basin. Without the petroleum. And when you have source rock and the reservoir and the carrier bed, then it's called the petroleum system. And I think as we go more commercial side, so this is the commercial side. Commercial, commercial prospect. So you you are going step by step. So uh, from the beginning, from geological perspective, it's a spacing, and if you find the Post rock and some system, petroleum system, then it becomes a prospective area. And you want to drill more and further explore whether it has a, a enough amount of the hydrocarbon to be explored. Then it becomes a commercial system. So, and then it calls the play. And then it becomes the prospect. So this is, this is just the terminology that people use in the petroleum geology. If it's a spacing, then it doesn't care whether it has a petroleum or not. But uh, when people call it a, it's a petroleum system in the in certain basin, then it has some potential. So petroleum system involves distance of secondary migration of petroleum and the time and the amount of petroleum that may have been generated within a given sedimentary basin. This is uh, uh, one important information piece for the petroleum system. Uh, so the, when we're looking at the petroleum migration, the lateral distance the people are looking at the distance from the source rock to the reservoir is one of the uh, big parameter. So they measure the distance between the petroleum accumulation and the nearest mature source rock. And I think we've seen the similar table in previous chapters. The migration distance could be 100, right, in the order of 100 kilometers. Right? 100 kilometer, 1,000 kilometers. And when we talk about the petroleum system and basin modeling, uh, the main purpose is to predict the amount of the petroleum in the basin, the quantity, so, so that we can assess the economic value of the basin. So we are talking about a basin scale, so it will be in the order of 100 kilometers. So basin area, and the volume of oil generated in an area may be calculated using the geochemical material balance method. And when they estimate the uh, oil volume, uh, volume of source rock is an important piece. And the generic potential is also one parameter. And generic potential is defined as the amount of petroleum that 
kerogen can generate. The transformation ratio is the ratio of the petroleum actually formed to the generic potential. So, mm -hmm. so these two generic potential and the transformation ratio is also the important parameters. So it's like this: you have a, like one cubic meter of the shale, which is source rock. How much kerogen you will have, right? and then from that kerogen, how much oil you will have? That's the uh, what these two parameters are. Mm, so transformation ratio, there are some uh, categories, right? So higher transformation ratio means that you have a more uh, prospect, prospective reservoir for the basin. And petroleum system facilitates the modeling of sedimentary basin as a means of finding out the quantity and location of the petroleum. So like this. economics of the increasing system. So from the basin, petroleum system, and play and prospect. So when you have a prospect, then you are thinking of the economics of producing hydrocarbons. Actually, this uh, petroleum system and the basin will be more, we'll talk about in chapter eight, when the, after the midterm, we'll talk about more. Mm, okay, so again, I think it's just, they have a, a way, several ways to calculate the um, amount of the hydrocarbon potential in the basin. So, charge vector and style of migration and the increment style is the uh, input parameters. And charge vectors is calculated based on the richness and volume of the source rock in the basin. And the style of entrainment is dependent on the length and continuity of the carrier bed. So, just think, yeah, a bit. And so this is the uh, summary of this chapter. Um, okay, I think this is important. Let's read this through. Uh, commercial quantities of oil and gas form from the metamorphism of organic matter. So basically, it's from the organic matter. And kerogen, which is a solid hydrocarbon disseminated in many shale, is formed from buried organic detritus and is capable of generating oil and gas. And there were three types of kerogen, uh, agar type, and lithium type, and humic. And type 1 tends to generate oil, and type 3, gas and coal, right? The maturation of kerogen is a function of temperature and to a lesser extent, time. And oil generation occurs between 60 degrees to 200, uh, 120 degrees Celsius. And gas generation is between 120 and 225 degrees Celsius. And source rock generally contain more than 1,500 ppm organic carbon but the other one is a small percentage of their contain hydrocarbon. Several techniques may, may be used to measure the maturity of source rock, highly of thermometer. And exact process of primary migration is unclear, but the solubility theory is the widely accepted. Um, so solubility of the hydrocarbon is low, but for the light, lighter hydrocarbon, uh, Solubility can be enhanced by high temperature and the presence of the soapy micelles. Mm. An empirical relationship between oil occurrence and clay dehydration suggests that the flushing of water from compacting clay plays an important role in primary migration. There is much evidence to suggest that the episodic flushing of water from overpressured shale by hydraulic fraction is an important process in our life. Petroleum to migrate from source rock to the carrier bed. So, so overpressure rise to shale here also play an important role. 